Several weeks ago, I had a number of points that I made in my sermon, and uh, one of my good friends here reminded me that after about two or three points, he's going to need a handout in order to keep up. So I've given you all a handout today. It's in the form of a bookmark. So if you'd open your Bibles to Luke chapter 15, we'll get started. I want to take you to the very most important verse for today, and that is verse 32. Are you ready? But, Jesus says, he's speaking now the words of the Father at the end of the third parable that he's told, but we had to celebrate. Now, I've said it with emphasis here. I'm now going to be the father. He's facing a son who is upset with him, and he's explaining, and he's telling about the emotions that he's feeling, and he's saying, I had no choice. The way that I was feeling when I saw your brother come over that hill, the only thing we could do was to celebrate. I couldn't help myself. We had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. You see, 30 verses before in Luke 15 verse 2, Jesus is now answering the attitude that has come from the church people. I've entitled our time together, When the Lost is Found. And that, that word when it, it implies that it's going to happen. And my friends, it is happening every day. The lost are being found. And they're being found by God. And he's using all kinds of agencies to make this happen. I was with some friends last night and, and I reminded them and I reminded myself just by saying it again. There are pieces of scripture that surprise you sometimes. One of them is when God calls uh, pagan kings his servants. My servant Cyrus. My, 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 my servant Nebuchadnezzar. These are people that we see in scripture uh, that are against God we think that are doing really bad things to God's people. But yet, they know the living God. They know the Creator God. They, they are in league with Him. We know a lot more about Nebuchadnezzar, of course, because we know what happened after he decided to claim his kingdom for himself. Today we're concentrating on the, on the reaction I want you to concentrate with me on the reaction of those who have lost something and, or someone, and, and on their reaction when they find the lost thing or person. So, in, in Luke 15, I really, really love Luke 15. You'll know that about me now and forever. Luke 15 has three stories of three lost, well, first we could call a sheep a thing, then a coin is a thing, and then a person, a boy. And these are the stories that Jesus tells because of the fact that the teachers of the law were muttering. What were they muttering? Okay, are you ready? This is what they were saying about your Jesus and my Jesus. This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. My mother always said, show me your friends, and I'll tell you your character. This is what they were saying about Jesus. He welcomes sinners into his friendship circle, and he eats with them. 
Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you had a hundred sheep and loses one. Does he not leave the 99 in the open country? Listen, church people. Do you feel like Jesus has left you in the open country while he's busy with somebody else this week? If so, fear not. <laughs> You're still part of the 99. Okay, but listen to the story. Because we're focusing on the reaction of what happens when something is that was lost is found. Does he not leave the 99 in open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? When he finds it, he, re he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors. Here's the reaction. Here's the reaction of what happens when that person who has lost something of value finds it. Calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me. I have found my lost sheep. Uh, I tell you, okay, so now Jesus is talking directly to the, to the people he's, he's got in front of him. I tell you the truth. In the same way, there will be more, more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 church people, my translation, who do not need to repent. Wow. So now we've been left in the open field while the the, the, as, as we talked about last week, the guardian of the galaxies is out searching for his lost children. And he's really happy. He's really happy when he finds one of those lost children and brings them back home. In fact, he seems to be even more happy than, than he usually is with us, those who have never left, if you want to count yourself as one of those today. Number, uh, okay, so let's, let's look. What's, what's the reaction? Uh, okay, that's, that's, that's losing the sun. Uh, uh, or suppose a woman. Now, ladies, this is a cool story because it involves ladies and it involves weddings. Okay? Understand that what we're about to talk, to talk to is the woman's bank account. Some of you uh, in your marriages have chosen to have separate, you know, this is my stash, no, this is my stash kind of thing. Uh, Chris and I have decided we only have one stash. And, and she runs it. So that's, that's, that's a good thing. Okay? Uh, suppose a woman has 10 silver coins. Now, uh, research shows us these were probably the silver coins her father gave her. That if you think of the Arabic dress and the headdress of a lady, when they get married, they often have these silver coins that are attached to the headdress. So these are, these are part of her dowry. This is her bank account. All right? So therefore, you must understand the, the, the value that she personally attaches to this. This is not her husband's money. This is her money. Does she not light a lamp, sweep the house, search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends. Again, here, here comes the reaction. She calls her friends and her neighbors. And you think, it's just a coin. She calls her friends and her neighbors, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost coin. In the same way, Jesus says, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. You see where he's, he's building the story. He's building the story. He's got one for the men, the shepherd. He's got one for the ladies, the lost coin. And so now he's, he's, he's building to the, the big story. Jesus continued, There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to the father, He's starting a story. He's got two sons, and it's the younger one. Okay? We could go into all sorts of derivations about this, but we're looking for reactions, so we'll go to the end quickly. The father, he said to the father, Give me my share of the estate. And the father complies. At this moment, his hearers, the people that are listening to Jesus, are in awe of the fact that the father complied with his son's demands. Just understand that. Okay. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had. Now this was what he had harvested probably from selling off his father's assets that had just been given to him. He got together all of what he had and he went off into a distant country. And there, and this is a great word, and I hope you love it like I do, he squandered. He wasted. You know, the old English is, a, this person was a, a wastrel. Okay. He squandered his wealth in wild living. And after he'd spent everything, there was a severe famine. So the, the economy tanked. 
because of the famine, and he was left, because he didn't have any money now, he was left in a very bad position. So he went out and hired himself out to a citizen of that country. Now, please understand that the, 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 Jesus loves to exaggerate. I, I don't know if you know that about Jesus. And, and I hope you don't think that it's because he's lying. He's not lying. He's telling a parable. And he exaggerates for emphasis, my father used to say. He exaggerates for emphasis. Here he's about to exaggerate because these are good Jewish Israelite people. And it's one of their sons who has now done this to his father, which is so terrible. And now he's wasted all his money. And now he's working for a foreigner stood beside somebody last night who actually knew the word goy or the plural goyim means gentile means someone who is not us because in their minds there was us and then there was everyone else now you know why I don't use that little hyphenated phrase non-adventist it's our version of the word Goyim. He hires himself out to a foreigner and Jesus emphasizes the situation by saying that he was now put in charge of feeding pigs. I mean, if you want to exaggerate to an Israelite audience, this is the way to do it. One of your best and brightest is now reduced to being a pig's herd. A pig's herd. He longed to fill his stomach. He's hungry. He doesn't have any food. Longed to fill his stomach with the pods the pigs were eating. But no one gave him anything. In other words, the farmer said, you touch my pig's food, you're fired. So he didn't have human food, and he wasn't allowed to even touch what was given to the pigs, which was probably the leftovers of what the man was eating himself. So... He comes to his senses and says, how many of my father's hired men have food to spare? And here am I starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and stay with him. He goes through a derivation here of story that he is going to tell his father about the fact that he no longer wants to be called a son and have that status. He just wants to be a servant. And he is, he's rehearsing the story as he comes over the hill. And as he comes over the hill, he is flabbergasted to see that there is a, a man running and that there is a dust cloud behind him. So again, look at reaction here. Look at reaction. There is a dust cloud behind him and, and there are servants trailing him and he's yelling to people. And as he gets closer, he realizes it's his father. And without even so much as listening to the first part of his prepared speech about being a servant now instead of, instead of a son, he feels his father's cloak going around his back. He hears his father, I mean, it's just now going into slow motion in some respects in, in his mind. He hears his father yelling to the servants, get the party tent ready. Kill the fatted calf. Bring my shoes out for my son. Bring another robe for my son. Wasn't going to share this, but latest research says he possibly was also protecting his son from being stoned. That that's why he ran was because the community was going to stone this wastrel for what he had done to his father. So his father runs out to literally envelop him with his body so that if anybody dared to think that he was going to have stones thrown at him, the first stones would hit him instead of his son. Reactions. Reactions to, to what was lost that is, is now found. But we get to the end of the story. Very quickly, I just want to tell you that in this situation, what I've just told you is that the father goes out to meet his son. 
The party has already started now, everything's going, and in from the field comes the older brother. And the older brother finds out from a servant what has happened, and he is livid. He is hopping mad, as we say in England. Just ugh, cannot believe that this is going on. Watch what happens. The father goes out. So church person, if, if you... If today you're thinking, oh, God only is after the drug addicts. He only reaches out to those who really need him. I, I want you to see the Father today leaving the tent, leaving the party. To go out to his son who is hopping mad with him. Now, I'm a good church person, I hope. I've been mad with God. You ever been mad with God? Jesus says to his listeners, the good son, the son who had never left, was refusing to come in. And so the father went out. Never saw this until rereading the story recently and just realizing that he didn't just go out to get the bad boy. He went out to explain himself to the good son. So you got questions? You, you, you don't understand God? He's going to come for you. He is going to come out from wherever he is, from whatever he is doing, and he is going to listen. He is going to want to explain. And that's when this verse that we have already read uh, comes in, <coughs> verse 31, the verse before. My son, the father said, you are always with me. You're on my team. And everything, everything that I have is yours. If you go away today with nothing else, church person, if you go away today with nothing else, please go away with that phrase. The God of heaven says, everything that I have is yours. If you feel poor, you've got to ask yourself why. Because the God of heaven, who owns everything, and is your father and mine, has just told you everything that I have is yours. I don't see how you can feel poor after saying that, after hearing that. You must be judging yourself by some other standard. There must be some other Lord in your life that's being stingy with you. Because this Lord, this guardian of the galaxies, as we went about, has, has just said in a parable, everything that, that I have to offer, I have given to you. It's yours. You're my son. You have the right to everything that I have. It's not good enough for the older brother, though. That's the, the pitiable part of this story. Because this brother of yours, now, in the statement that the older brother has made to his father, he says, this son of yours. No, no, no. The father changes that. He doesn't refer to my other son. He refers to this brother of yours. That's kin. That's family. Can't get away from it. This brother of yours that was dead is alive again. He was lost and is found. So as we, as we examine this a little closer, we can see that we, we have a father who runs out to meet his boy. We have an older brother who doesn't see or know that his brother has come home. We have a father who starts a celebration right away. He kills the fatted calf. We have an older brother who finds out from a servant what is going on already. 
We have a father that goes out to talk to the older brother who is hopping mad with him. We have an older brother who is mad at his younger brother for wasting his inheritance. He's mad with his father for taking him, uh, for, for, for taking the, the younger brother back. He's mad with the father for being so generous. He's mad with the father because he really doesn't love him and is waiting for the stingy old guy to die so that he can have everything that he thinks should be his. He's mad now uh, because he, he, he wants his share. He wants his share now, just like the younger brother. Can you see how similar they are? And yet the older brother, the older brother hates his younger brother. But in verse 32... God says, but we had to celebrate. We had to celebrate. He was dead. Now he's alive. He, he was lost. <laughs> we, we didn't know what was going on with him. But, but, but now he has found. So I say to all of us today, may we, may we celebrate with our Heavenly Father. May we enjoy being found. Do you want to be found today? I, I want to be found today. May we enjoy being found. May we love with the same love that our Heavenly Father has for every single human being on planet Earth. Because when the lost are found, there is a celebration in heaven like no other. Let's join that celebration. Amen?